We're going to spend um, a few moments talking to you about the issue of the nexus between security and development. Uh, as everybody knows, we are living in a um, time of great challenge and oftentimes when you turn on the, the news you see a lot of challenge issues uh, going on around the world and a lot of those are issues that we think about in the context of security. But I think we're here today to talk about how security and development are so intertwined and how some of the challenges that we often think about as security challenges are, all, are, are actually issues that are um, most often um, best addressed by also thinking about the development aspects of those. And so we have two people who have both served in the military and served in uh, different branches in our military, Navy, Marine, who, uh, who have also taken on the challenges of the development arena. So I'm just going to start with, maybe I'll start with you first, uh, Senator. And why me? Uh, why you? Because you're to my Want left. Want to pick on the Navy, huh? Uh, well, because you're to my left. <laughs> but maybe just start like with far you. left. Uh, just uh, right here. <laughs> but maybe just starting with what? What do you think about this nexus of development and security? And as somebody who spent a lot of time in the uh, armed forces, how do you square that? What were some of your own experiences, and why does that come to bear in your own thinking about the development arena, and why you're so committed to those issues? Next question. <laughs> okay, let me just, uh, I'll take it in a, a direction you probably wouldn't anticipate. I, I focused as a, a senior Democrat, former chairman of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security on why are all these people trying to come across our border in, uh, from uh, Mexico into the U.S.? As it turns out, they're not coming from Mexico. There are more Mexicans going back into Mexico than Mexicans coming into the U.S. But they're mostly uh, the folks that are trying to get into uh, the U.S., into Texas are from Honduras, they're from Guatemala, they're from Salvador. And the reason why they're trying to get into uh, our country is because the lives that they live there are hellacious. And we're complicit in their uh, lack of opportunity, lack of economic opportunity. And a big part of it is la a lack of the rule of law. And uh, what, what we've started doing as, as a country, and Joe Biden's been very much involved in this, the president, I've been involved in it, in my, in my role in the Senate, to try to uh, replicate to an extent uh, something that's usually called Plan Columbia, in fact, it's still called Plan Colony. It's about 15, 20 years old. Joe Biden's very much involved in it uh, a long time ago. Bill Clinton was very much involved in it. And it's a partnership between uh, Colombia and the U.S. and some other nations and the uh, Inter-American Development Bank and so forth to try to uh, address r rule of law. And, and, you know, they had a guerrilla war there. And in fact, I think the FARC just basically stood down just a, couple, a month or so ago. But we have a situation where you have a great uh, a gang violence. And all these drugs that come through Honduras, Guatemala, and Salvador as a transit, they come to our country. Uh, they send us drugs. We send them uh, guns and money. And the, uh, the, the bad guys down there use the guns and money to make their lives miserable. And then, so a, a big part of what we're trying to do now with those countries is a new version of Plan Colombia, not for Colombia, but for Honduras, Guatemala, and Salvador. And the idea is to uh, enable them to address maybe three or four areas. One, rule of law, security. Uh, lack of education for, for a lot of the folks who, who live there, lack of infrastructure, roads, and uh, uh, electric grid, and that sort of thing. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete package. It's not just one thing. And the U.S. is putting up uh, about $750 million in the current budget to, uh, to help out, not to give to these countries, but to support their, their efforts to restore rule of, rule of law, infrastructure, and uh, uh, human infrastructure. You know, one of the things that we hear so often is that um, as we enter into a more global economy that we're losing jobs uh, because we're thinking globally. Um, but, you know, when I look at what's going on, for instance, and in, you, you mentioned Central America, I look at what's going on in, in Venezuela where they're now having to open their borders so that their citizens can go over to Colombia to get basic needs. Could you say something about why it's so important for us to invest globally in these development issues because, you know, at least from where I sit, I think it, it ultimately um, we're better off if the rest of the world is also able to prosper. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm going to go somewhere different from this. Uh, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to raise. I was in a little town in uh, uh, southern Delaware the other day, 
and a town called Milton, M-I-L-T-O-N. They're famous for being the home of Dogfish Head Beer. And I don't know if anybody here drinks beer, but Dogfish Head Big Nobody drinks beer. Craft beer, big craft beer, <laughs> very popular. Nobody drinks beer. And um, in any event, I was having a meeting with the sort of the leaders of the town. And one of the people there raised the issue of foreign aid and of how we're giving away all this money, all this money to other countries. We have so much need in our own state, in our own country. Why are we doing this? And I said to the guy, I said, well, what percentage of uh, our budget do you think we spend on foreign aid? And usually when I ask this question, people say 20, 25 percent. He said 5 percent. I said, no, it's not. It's 1 percent. It's 1 percent. And he said, well, if it, even if it's just 1 percent, why are we doing this? And I, I used uh, uh, Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, Matthew 25, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was... Uh, Thirsty, did you give me a drink? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick and in prison, did you come to visit me? When I was a stranger in your land, did you take me in? I said, I think we have, I don't care what our faith is, we have a moral imperative to help the least of these, mm -hmm. uh, whether in our country, our state, or some other country, especially when we make their lives so miserable in some of these places by virtue of our addiction to drugs. And I said, I, but we don't have a lot of uh, extra money in our budget, yeah. so we have to find a fiscally responsible way to meet that moral commitment. That's sort of the way I look at these. Okay. All right, that, that's worth an applause. Thank you, thank you. Right, um, I had the fortune of going to visit uh, Kibera, um, for, Kibera for Kenya, uh, right, um, and maybe say a little bit about that project. Um, it, I think it very much represents what he was talking about, how citizens can really reach out to others around the world, and, and you having started this program that has been a real beacon for the citizens of Kenya. If you would just say a little bit about your motivation for that, how that has developed, and, and um, a little bit about what you see as the future of that program. Sure, thanks so much. And, and I'm a, a co-founder of this NGO, and that was actually really important. That's where it began, because the two other founders are Kenyans from this community in Nairobi, which is one of the larger informal settlements. I was um, going slums. Slums. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it is one of the largest slum areas in the entire world. That's correct. Right. And about a sixth of the world's population lives in informal settlements or slums. It has a technical definition. It means that people do not own land tenure, so they don't own the rights to build, and the the, the structures themselves are semi permanent. So they're typically made out of mud or corrugated iron. Uh, Kibera itself, no one knows the full population, but it's um, estimated to be about 200 to 300,000 people living in an area about the size of Central Park. Um, I, I went there initially not to co-found an organization, but rather I was a student. I was in an ROTC program planning to go into the Marine Corps, and it was before September 11th. And I assumed that the types of missions that I'd be sent on would be of a peacekeeping type of nature. And so I wanted to be better prepared for the career that I was going into. Um, I decided to go into the Marine Corps at a very early age because that, my, my father had served and many of my earliest mentors were uh, Marines. It seemed to be a way that I could make a difference. And while I was there in Kibera, I met some really compelling people and um, realized something that I believe is a truth in the world, whether you're here in the United States or uh, halfway around the world in, in Kenya, and that is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And, um, you know, when you realize that talent is universal, but opportunity is not, you can see ways that you can really serve effectively as, as a catalyst um, and learn as much as you can give back. Uh, one of my co-founders took a small grant for just $26, sold vegetables for about six months, and then started a small medical clinic. She's a nurse in the, in the community. And over the course of 15 years, we're now 15 years old as an organization, has grown that into uh, a very large medical facility that treats about uh, 30,000 patients a year and works in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where Helene used to run international programs and does really important work in the community while also generating knowledge that can be beneficial for, for communities outside of it. And, um, and that, that, that w that's been a deeply enriching and rewarding part of my life. I've been a volunteer for it for, for now 15 years. I continued to volunteer when I served in the Marine Corps for five years. Um, I don't think it would have been possible for my own narrative had it not been for the Marine Corps. That really is my first calling. Um, I consider it the best education I had. And when I think about the nexus between those two worlds, the most essential 
connection point that comes together um, can really be embraced by one word. And it's a word that speaks to our values. It's a core value. Can anybody guess what it is? Compassion, Compassion is a good, good one. Treat other people the way we want to be treated. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah, the golden rule. It's actually integrity. It's integrity. It's doing the right thing when nobody's looking. If I think about the greatest challenges both in the United States and around the world, it's the, the raft of corruption. It's the loss of your values. It's not staying true to who you are. And um, so what we've tried to do in an organization is really build that from the ground up. And I'm delighted to have one of our, our board members who's actually here in the audience, Beth Ann Kuchma, has been a part of the organization as well for about 15 years. Um, but that's a unifying, the unifying bond are the, are the values and working together with small teams over a, a long period of time. Elaine, once uh, the name Alan Simpson, does that ring a bell with you? Alan Simpson, former senator from uh, Wyoming. Yeah. Very funny guy. But he said some serious things too. And uh, following up on what Rye just said about integrity, Alan Simpson used to say this about integrity. He said, integrity, if you have it, nothing else matters. Integrity, if you don't have it, nothing else matters. Yeah, no, it's true. I think it's an important notion that sometimes we don't think about as much as being as core as, as it is. You know, one of the things that both of you kind of touched on in, in your comments, and you know, I think about it as we think about this nexus between development and security, and you know, why focusing on the global arena makes so much difference. I mean, clearly, you know, and I think your comments um, really brought that out, why it matters for us to make, to, to really pay attention to the rest of the world. But you know, when you think about where we are in our security issues, and I remember being in Kibera slums and talking to people there who said, you know, the ability to feed my family keeps me from doing some of the things that I might do otherwise that would be security risk. And if we think about even the challenges that we have here in our own country, where you know, we're facing every day insecurity in poor neighborhoods and all the rest of it, if we're not taking care of people's basic needs and giving them the sense of a hope for future, you know, I think we aren't able to um, guarantee a secure world, whether it's around our globe or whether it's here in our own, in our own neighborhoods. Say a little bit about your experiences in Kibera where people were facing just basic dire needs and what that did to give them a sense of hope for the future, looking at uh, how they would um, show up differently and, and how that bears on our security issues. Yeah, thanks for that and I, I was gonna come back to it of the nexus where, where it really begins. If any of you have lived without security or in moments where you lack your safety, you Think about, think about what your mentality was at that moment. And it is truly the beginning of that hierarchy of needs because when you are not safe, it's all consuming. You can't do anything else. God help you if you have a family. We now have two young kids and they're not safe. So the first piece of the development enterprise, it has to be secure. You have to be, you have to be safe first, free of violence. And then, and then you can build on that, okay, can you, are you meeting your basic needs of food? I mean, this, hunger is a similar thing. I mean, have you, it's, it's worthwhile. We had a, a challenge that we um, encouraged college students to do in collaboration with the One Campaign called the 26 Day Challenge, where just for 26 days you just do one thing that embodies how, you know, much of the world lives. And one of the challenges was to just drink bread, just drink water and eat bread. Well, just try that for a couple days. It's actually real. It's actually very edifying. It, it puts you into a mentality that you can begin to understand where you have to you have to have this this basic set of needs addressed in order to in order to progress. Uh, funnily enough, uh, I think it's kind of funny. At least in, in the Navy, there is still a punishment uh, if you're acting out. The commander can actually put you on bread and water for I think three days. And um, I, I drank a lot of water and ate a lot of <laughs> bread when I was in the Navy, so 23 years. So. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah. Can I just mention, what was it like? Yeah. It was uh, after a couple of days, I, yeah. I was ready for something else. Yes. <laughs> Can I just mention, uh, we, uh, in Delaware, we have uh, a lot of uh, folks who live in southern Delaware 
who were from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And they originally came up through Mexico uh, into Texas. And some of them had families in southern Delaware. We have poultry processing plants. We raise a lot of chickens there. We have corn and soybeans uh, there. And uh, the, uh, so I've had a chance to meet with a number of the folks who came to, uh, to our, 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 con our country from these places. And uh, what's happened in Honduras, Guatemala, and Salvador is extortion. You have gangs, and the gangs, they make money off of the transiting of drugs, but they also m make money off of extortion. And the folks that get extorted are small businesses. Mm -hmm. And you know, small businesses in this country are the greatest source of new jobs. And in those countries, it would be as well, except if you set up a tamale uh, you know, business in, in the uh, street corner, after a couple of months, somebody's gonna come along with a gun and said, I, I'm ready to protect you, but you've gotta pay me so much money. And actually, they're just extorting money. And when, I, when I was in Honduras last year, they told me that 15,000 small businesses had been shut down. People just gave up. A lot of times they tried to flee and get out of the country. But businesses, in order for small businesses, to, big businesses to be successful, you need certainly predictability. And one of the things you need, to the right point, is the, the, the knowledge of the belief that you're gonna be safe and that somebody's gonna come with a gun and blow your head away because you won't uh, give them money uh, every week or every month. I, yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think another key connection point uh, is it between both security and development is that <laughs> It's got to be owned locally. Right. And CARE has done, a, a, I think, a, a, a really magnificent job as a, lo as a large NGO in pushing a model of, some people call it participatory development, but where, where the, the actual decisions, the resource allocation decisions are made on the ground. And what happened in Iraq, I was in Iraq and Fallujah in, in 2005, 2006, before we started really emphasizing the transition of our security forces to local local Iraqi forces. Um, and we were, we were essentially running all of the security missions on your own. You, it's, it's impossible if you, to have effective security if there's not uh, a local presence that actually has that capacity. It's impossible to have effective de development if, if you don't have the local capacity that's really leading it and in charge of it. Mm -hmm. so one other element, um, you know, both, and you mentioned one, and I see one volunteers here. Um, I'm on the board of, of one and, and um, you know, was uh, at the helm of CARE for almost a decade, and, and both ONE and CARE really focus on the issue of women as core to development. And, you know, I think for far too long we haven't thought about why it is so important to put women at the, central of, at the center of these issues. If both of you, I'd love to have both of you say a little bit about your own experiences and why if you agree with me that, that it is core in our development and even in our issues around peace and security, why it's so important to make sure that women are included. Well, we have a, a saying in our house. Uh, you may have the same saying in your house. If mom is not happy, <laughs> nobody's happy. So just for my own personal happiness, I know to elevate, elevate my wife and make sure I listen to what she has to say. As it turns out, uh, Barbara Mikulski had a birthday, uh, Senator from, uh, from Maryland, had a birthday uh, in the last week. I, I called my colleagues on their birthday if we're not in certain session, and even former colleagues, and I called her on her birthday, and I, she's 80 years old, and she, wow. uh, she's step stepping down at the end of this year from the, the Senate. But about 25 years or so ago, when she was starting, she was the only woman. She was the only woman. After the elections this, uh, this fall, probably fully 20 women will be serving in the United States uh, Senate. As it turns and, out, and they're- And woman president. And woman president. They're taking over <laughs> quite, I, guys like us, you know, right, we're, we're limited. We're, we're like top, we're in glass ceiling now <laughs> situation. But uh, some, as it turns out in the Senate, I think we have like, about, about, I don't know, 13, 14 committees, maybe 15. And uh, women uh, are either the se senior Democrat or the chairs uh, or ranking members of half of the committees, half the committees. And frankly, they work hard. They're much, I think they're much better than some of our guys in terms of doing the, th the three C's that are, I think, needed for a vibrant democracy. Communicate, compromise, collaborate. I don't know if it's instinctive or just in their, their gender, their nature, but the women are actually, in many cases, better than the, the guys where I work on communicating, collaborating, compromising. Yeah, when I, when I think about, you know, another development phrase is theory of change. What's your theory of change? And um, when I think about what's the most important piece of a theory of change when you're engaged in a place for a long period of time, it's that eventually young people will 
grow up with a different set of values and, and challenge and improve the system in which they live in and fundamentally take on the corruption that's around them. And what we found in Kibera, which, and we have a mixed program, and by the way, we also find that having that gender balance is also really important because you also can't leave the guys out. Um, uh, in fact, for the, a very practical reason because often the, the violence is perpetrated by the men. And so you have to engage collaboratively. But what we find w among our, our group, we have about 5,000 young people in the organization, is that oftentimes the, the, the young women are, are, are the most effective at, being, at, at doing things and getting things done and, and, um, and, 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 and taking on new initiatives. And you know, uh, just like any marginalized population, for, for many years, I mean, up until about six years ago, in, uh, well, about 10 years ago in Kibera, there was no soccer program, for example, for girls. There, there was just no outlet. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's also a, a matter, I think, of, of doing what's right. Well, good. I see um, the timekeeper back there is telling me that we're out of time, but I will give both of you two seconds to uh, add any final comments. I think your comment of doing what's right is a great comment, but uh, I'll give you both a chance to say anything more that you might want to say just to wrap up and then we will close out the session. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, it's great to uh, be able to spend this time with, uh, with both of you and with our guests out there. I know you're out there, it's hard to see you though. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, we talked about integrity, how important integrity is and uh, that's a key component of leadership. Uh, when we choose a president, uh, we are looking for the right man or, or woman. And Joe Biden likes to say that uh, uh, elections are always about the future. And I've modified that over time to say elections are about who's going to lead us into the future and the kind of qualities that we should look for in a leader. And I always like to say, and I learned a lot of this in the military in, uh, in my time and from my parents and our faith, but uh, leaders should be humble, not haughty. Uh, leaders should have the heart of a servant. Uh, they should lead by example. It's not. Uh, do as I say, but do as I do. Leaders should have the courage to stay out of step when everybody else is marching to the wrong tune. They should be focused on doing, uh, every, uh, pursuing excellence in everything they do, trying to figure out the right thing to do, embracing the golden rule. And then when they know they're right, they're sure they're right. Just uh, don't give up. And those are, as, as we uh, prepare to vote for uh, president and governors and senators this year, I hope we'll see, keep some of those, uh, those thoughts in, in mind. Humble, not haughty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Helene. I think I'll also offer something um, political, and I've never done this before, but uh, what the heck, we're at the Democratic National Convention. Whether you care about de development or security or just frankly the direction of this nation, there, <laughs> you must vote for Hillary Clinton. I mean, you, you must vote for Hillary Clinton. I, 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 you may not, it's, um, I, I think, and, and, Donald Trump, I believe, is an absolute threat to all of our values, starting with that word of integrity. I can't believe a word that the man says. My business partner, uh, Dan McCready, um, just wrote an op-ed that was published today in Time magazine. Uh, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Donald Trump's addressing the Veterans for Foreign Wars convention there today. And Dan, who's also a fellow Marine, wrote an op-ed today about why um, no veteran should, should vote for Donald Trump. I encourage you all to read it. Uh, thanks. All right, well, w this, this is a, a great forum when the, the uh, issues of general compassion and, and integrity are from our senator and the political message is from our <laughs> civilian colleague. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you both very much for, for being part of this panel. And thank you for your incredible wisdom your service, and the example that both of you ha um, have presented today. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.